This podcast is brought to you through the support of listeners who have become patrons at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Patrons receive lots of bonus content, including access to each episode a week early. Throughout this series, I will be thanking each and every patron. And this week, I want to thank Eileen Vustemere, Speed Electronics Limited in Ennis, Deb Rothman and John McCabe for their support. I really appreciate it. If you want to become a patron, you can sign up today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is part two of my new series on the Great Famine, Riots, Rent and Volcanoes, Ireland 1800 to 1845. In the last podcast, we got the series off to a somewhat bloody start with the story of the 1798 and 1803 rebellions and then we looked at the Act of Union in 1801 where Ireland was merged into the United Kingdom. In this podcast, we will look at what happened in the 40 or so years between those events and the Great Famine. Ireland had just been incorporated into the biggest and most advanced economy in the world. Those in favour of this move promised great things. The reality was somewhat different and in this show we will see how strikes, assassinations and riots became more frequent, not to mention how a volcano on the other side of the world impacted Ireland. From rowdy silk weavers in Dublin to the lives of opulent landlords in rural Ireland, this show is a snapshot of Ireland in the decades before the famine. And to begin, we start with the story of a woman who defied conventions in Georgian Dublin. Barbara Versoil was an unusual figure in Georgian Dublin. Were she alive today, she would be the type person that might figure in one of those glossy supplements that come with newspapers announcing Dublin's 50 most influential people. Now, this was not what a woman was supposed to be in Georgian-era Dublin. Barbara was expected to marry, have children and perform the duties of a wife. But she did far more. As the agent or manager for the estate of Viscount Fitzwilliam of Merion, a significant landlord in County Dublin, she oversaw the completion of Merion Square, a major development that had been started by her father Brian, the agent before her. Merion Square was a series of beautiful terraced houses surrounding a landscaped park which expanded Dublin eastwards, providing pristine homes for the city elite. Given her role in developing such an important project, Barbara Verschoyle, therefore, was a keen observer of commercial life in Dublin, and the Act of Union in 1801 seriously worried her. When it was announced, she predicted that this Act, which dissolved Ireland's Parliament and merged Ireland into the United Kingdom, would be disastrous for Dublin and indeed Merrion Square. When Union was first mooted in 1798, her reaction was that it would be the ruin of this country. She feared the wealthy of Dublin society would have little reason to stay in the city and would follow their political representatives to London. The future of Merrion Square was cast into doubt and, in her words, now no one wishes for anything but to get shot of what they have here. The union is the terror of everyone and I am sorry to say, even here in this delightful spot, Merrion Square, we shall have grass where it was once pavement. The worst fears of Barbara Verschoyle were materialised. In 1801, as we saw in the last podcast, the Act of Union was passed and only three years later a visitor to Dublin in 1804 noted how the rich had already fled the city. The higher ranks in general follow the Parliament. It is fashionable to go where the principal people of the country are to be found and the gentleman, though not in Parliament, carries his daughter where the sons of families of distinction principally resort. This soon took its toll on Dublin. While Merrion Square struggled to find tenants for its beautiful houses, even the most prestigious houses in the city were soon lying idle. In 1813, Alborough House, a beautiful mansion to the northeast of Dublin, was leased to a school. And then, two years later, the Duke of Leinster's palatial residence in the city, Leinster House, which formed the western side of Merrion Square, was taken over by the Royal Dublin Society, a philanthropic organisation. While the flight of the city elite may have tarnished Barbara Verschoyle's plans for Dublin, transforming the palatial homes into empty, lifeless reminders of Dublin's fading glory, the impact at the other end of society, in the streets of working-class areas, was even greater. Mm-hmm. 
While Barbara Fairchild had been concerned about what would happen to Marion Square, others were increasingly worried about their very survival in the aftermath of the Act of Union because it unleashed chaos in the business world of Dublin. Those involved in Dublin's emerging manufacturing industries were particularly dreading the impact of union with Britain. In Dublin around 1800, thousands worked in the linen and silk industries in the city. Indeed, these were part of the very fabric, pardon the terrible fun, of Dublin. Weavers passed their skills on to their children and there were families in the city who must have been working in the silk and linen industries for centuries. However, the Act of Union unleashed a whirlwind on these families and their communities. Around the time of the Act of Union, Britain was the most developed economy in the world. Its industry was changing over to steam power, which, when employed on a grand scale, could cut the price of linen and silk garments dramatically. Ireland's industry would have to change and adapt, no matter what. But the prospect of union with Britain, with its massive economy, did not bode well because Ireland would be no longer able to tax those cheap imports from the steam-powered factories in Britain. Basically, the weavers of linen and silk in Dublin were like a sports team about to be promoted from a lower league to the top division. This convulsed the city. The full effects took hold in the 1820s when the final clauses of the Act of Union were imposed and Ireland could no longer tax goods from England. This triggered a bitter struggle between Dublin's craftsmen, the weavers, and their employers. Cheap linen and silk from factories in Britain flooded Dublin and when manufacturers tried to pass on their losses to the weavers, they resisted vehemently. From the weavers' perspective, they did not need to look far to see where falling wages would lead. They already lived in neighbourhoods surrounded by grinding poverty. John Griscom, who visited Dublin in 1818, had commented how the doors of carriages and shops are beset by crowds of unfortunate and clamorous beggars, exhibiting misery and decrepitude in a variety of forms. Themselves the victims of idleness, their children were taught to look to begging as affording the only means of subsistence. Desperately trying to avoid plunging their families into such destitution, the weavers tried to organise strikes to stop their wages falling. Some strikes could be extremely bitter as weavers tried to force employers who cut wages out of business. One manufacturer, called McConnell, recalled this strike with silk weavers in Dublin when he cut wages. I made an agreement with men to give them work under the usual price. The body, that's the trade union, got information and called a general meeting on that business and came to the unanimous resolution at the meeting that no person, for the future, should work for me. A few nights after, my works were consumed by sulfuric acid thrown into the windows by unknown persons and no person connected with the trade would work for me for fear. The effect of all this was to drive me from the business. However, militancy like this could not stop wages falling. By the 1830s, children were frequently forced to work with their parents as wages were so low and families could no longer survive. But many of the manufacturing industries in Dublin were on the way out. By 1838, a House of Commons subcommittee heard how the silk industry in the city, which had once given employment to a large number of people, was now said to be limited and gradually passing away. The committee concluded that the weavers' actual condition was wretched in the extreme. The same trend was seen in the city's linen trade. In the 1790s, there had been up to 5,000 linen weavers working in Dublin. The symbol of the trade was the Linen Hall, a vast complex to the north of Dublin, once teeming with activity and trade. By 1828, the wind howled through empty warehouses as the complex was shut down, the linen industry in Dublin on the verge of collapse. Dublin was not the only place affected. Further up the east coast, at the port of Drogheda, the weavers there were impoverished as the collapse in price devastated their livelihood. While there was still nearly 2,000 people employed in the linen industry in Drogheda by the late 1830s, the House of Commons inquiry found them to be the lowest paid weavers in Ireland, their wives frequently having to beg so they could survive. The report described their houses in the following terms. The cabins the weavers live in are fearful sinks of filth. While the years after the Act of Union led to growing urban unemployment and poverty, there was one major exception, that is Belfast and the North East. While accounts from Ireland in this period generally reflect on what was increasing poverty, Henry Cook was able to give a much more positive commentary on his native Belfast when he said, 
When I was a youth, it was almost a village. But what a glorious sight does Belfast now represent. The masted grove within the harbour. Our mighty warehouses teeming with wealth of every climate. Our giant manufacturers lifting themselves on every side. All this we owe to Union. Belfast's success in the early 19th century was impressive and uncomparable in Ireland at the time. By 1845, on the eve of the Great Famine, there were 17,000 people employed in factories in Belfast. While Ireland's cities, save Belfast, were suffering and the poor were clearly growing poorer, next we need to turn our gaze to rural Ireland, the world of the poor peasant and powerful landlord, an image that dominates our stereotypes of Ireland in the 19th century. Given the role they played during the Great Famine, I'm first going to look at the landlords. Landlords are really important in our story, not only because they were central to the rural economy, but because they were blamed by many for the Great Famine, so we need to take a close look at them and their luxurious lives. In the 1840s, there were around 10,000 landlords in Ireland. They were a varied bunch, ranging from what were small landlords who might own a few hundred acres, all the way up to the likes of the Marquess of Conningham, who owned 157,000 acres in Mead. Many of them had been granted their estates for their loyalty to one English king or another. So, for example, while the Dukes of Leinster could trace their origins back to the 12th century and their service to Henry II during the Norman invasion, the Earl of Arlington, on the other hand, was something of a newcomer, only having been granted his lands by Charles II in the 1660s. While landlords were generally individuals, some of the biggest were actually institutions. So Ireland's oldest university, Trinity College Dublin, was one of the largest landowners in Ireland. The penal laws had ensured that as a group, landlords in Ireland were almost exclusively Protestant. However, wealthy Catholics did get in on the game by subletting large tracts of land and then charging tenants a markup. The most famous of these being Daniel O'Connell, who led the campaign for Catholic emancipation. He rented land from Trinity College for less than £900 and then sublet it to hundreds of poor tenants for around £1,500. Now the symbol of these landlords' power and their most recognisable legacy today is their residences, the stately mansions which dominated the Irish landscape in the 19th century. These houses, like their owners, varied. Some were just large country houses, but the largest had hundreds of rooms, large staffs and were nothing short of palatial. Think Downton Abbey or Pemberley in Pride and Prejudice. Kilkenny Castle, for example, the seat of the Dukes of Ormond, was a massive medieval fortress converted into something resembling a French chateau in the 18th century. While these houses scattered the landscape of Ireland today, often in ruins, their former inhabitants, pre-famine landlords, have something of a notorious reputation in Irish history, based partly in reality and partly in myth. The first and most frequent accusation against them is that they were absentees, An absentee landlord is one who chose to live somewhere other than their estate, often taking little or no interest in them, yet creaming off the rent. William Bence Jones, a landlord who lived on his estate in Cork in the late 19th century, revealed how absent these absentee landlords could be when discussing his ancestors. My grandfather never saw the estate in his life. My father saw it but once when he drove along the mail coach road that skirts it in a carriage, stopped for half an hour, to talk to the tenants who met him and then drove back again. Overall, somewhere between one-third and one-fifth of Irish landlords were absentees, undoubtedly something accentuated by the Act of Union. After the Act, if landlords were members of Parliament or the House of Lords, they had to spend most of their time in London. Absentees have been vilified in Irish history. They spent little or no time on their lands, yet each year they took rent off poor tenants. However, there might actually have been a silver lining in that some of these absentees were probably better off staying away. If they appointed a good agent to manage affairs, these individuals could prove far more effective than a resident landlord who ran the estate into the ground through mismanagement. The estates of the Duke of Devonshire in Cork and Waterford were a testament to this. Although the Duke was an absentee landlord, his estates were among the best managed in the country. However, that said, during the famine, the fact that landlords did not live on their estates inevitably ensured that they were less susceptible to pressure and undoubtedly this made it easier to evict, but we'll address that down the road. 
Another stereotype is that they lived lavish lives far beyond their means. This certainly has a basis in reality and undoubtedly was of much greater importance than whether they were absentees or not. Many lived way beyond their means. This is seen in the lavish building projects they engaged in, which were ludicrously expensive. For example, Mitchellstown Castle in Cork, completed in the 1820s, cost £220,000, a huge sum for the time. Perhaps the greatest symbol of this was their domain lands. These were vast pleasure gardens and hunting grounds exclusively used by the family and their guests. These were totally unproductive, brought in no revenue, but also cost large sums to create and maintain. By the 1840s, these domains occupied 800,000 acres, 4% of Ireland, and some of the best land available at that. Cormac O'Grada, the economic historian, has estimated that these could have kept 100,000 families in comfort. Unsurprisingly, a significant number of landlords were increasingly struggling. By the 1840s, 10% of land in Ireland was leveraged as collateral on loans. And by 1844, over 1,000 Irish estates had gone bankrupt. This was even before the onset of famine, which would lead to many more going bust. Perhaps more importantly than landlords, though, are those who are most at risk at the outset of famine, the rural poor. And after this short break... Now, let's get back to the show. While landlords enjoyed lavish lifestyles, the early 19th century, and indeed the road to the Great Famine, was a turbulent and rocky one for the vast majority of the population of rural Ireland. The years between 1780 and 1815 had been good overall, and the impact of the Act of Union seemed negligible in rural Ireland. War with France had choked off all trade between Britain and continental Europe, leaving Ireland a free run at the growing markets for food in Britain. While this had benefited many, it was brought to an abrupt end in 1815 when Ireland was sucker-punched by two international events. The first a well-known battle, the second an utterly bizarre and unusual natural disaster. On June 15, 1815, the Duke of Wellington defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, bringing over 20 years of war between England and France to an end. But surely peace was good news? Well, not necessarily if you lived in rural Ireland. The war, as I've said, had been great for business. However, once peace was established, trade with continental Europe resumed and prices for rural produce plummeted. Recession followed and, while this hit rural Ireland hard, it was followed up by a second, utterly bizarre event, making the situation far worse. So a few months before the Battle of Waterloo, a volcano, Mount Tamboro, in modern-day Indonesia, erupted. Now, no one in Ireland even knew Mount Tamboro existed, or that it had erupted. Indeed, the first Irish newspaper report about it was in the Belfast Newsletter, a full eight months later, in January 1816. By this point, you might be wondering why I'm even talking about it. However, the power of this volcanic eruption was phenomenal. You might remember that Icelandic volcano that grounded planes in 2010. Well, the Mount Tamboro eruption was around 1,000 times more powerful. It spluttered ash into the atmosphere and this wreaked havoc on the weather through 1816, which, because of poor weather, became known as the Year Without Summer. Parts of Europe reported snow discoloured with ash through the summer and while Ireland did not suffer anything so extreme, 1816 was marked by dire harvests. This dealt a severe blow to an economy already struggling. Food shortages were followed by an outbreak of typhoid that killed as many as 60,000 people in Ireland alone. This was a considerable blow, as you might imagine, to the rural economy and marked a turning point. In the following years, while the overall economy would recover, some changes that occurred led to bitter conflict. While many parts of the island continued to focus on producing crops, in Mead, that's the county to the north of Dublin, landlords reacted to the changing economy by reorganising their lands and switching from growing crops to raising cattle herds. Now while this might seem like a boring, even irrelevant change, this transformation turned the lives of many poor tenants upside down. 
The changeover from tillage to pasture, while lucrative for farmers, involved clearing farmland to create large fields or pastures for cattle. This meant not only stopping growing crops, but all too often it also meant the eviction of poor tenants who worked the land. They were simply surplus to requirements in this new economy. The change could be brutal. One account from me in 1828 recalled, 14 families, small tenants occupying from 5 to 15 acres each, were ejected, their houses pulled down and their lands laid down to grass and added to that of a large farmer who held already above 800 acres. Most of these tenants became labourers. We can only imagine the bitterness an act like this must have provoked. Their homes, filled with memories, where they had been born and perhaps seen their parents die, were pulled down. And all for what? To make way for animals? While this naturally benefited the larger farmers, those being evicted were impoverished. The dispossessed, who now were reduced to labourers working on the farms of bigger farmers, led transient lives, renting houses and small plots of land on a seasonal basis in what was called the Conacre system, a feature of life that would be very important during the Great Famine. The farmers, who they worked for, rented them these small plots of land in what was an almost feudal system. This example from County Louth in 1845 was a typical arrangement. A certain farmer, Hughes, near the town of R.D., gave labourers who worked on his farm half an acre of what was called potato land, which was heavily manured, along with a cottage and a small garden for vegetables and the space to graze a cow. During the coming year, for the labourer and his family, this plot would become their world. Measuring perhaps 40 metres by 50 metres, it was not only their home, but it was where nearly all their food had to be grown. The only crop that could provide enough food from a plot of that size was the potato, so this conacre system increased people's dependence on the potato. This is something I'm going to look at in greater detail in the next episode. While the drop in wages had resulted in strikes in Dublin in the 1820s, This growing impoverishment of many in rural areas inevitably led to conflict, some of which, as we will see next, was extremely violent. In many areas, struggles broke out between peasants who formed secret societies known as ribbon men and the farmers over conacre rents and the wages the farmers paid. Threats, beatings and murders in these situations were not uncommon. In response, the authorities replied with prison sentences, transportation to penal colonies in Australia and executions for the poor peasants. The ferocity of these struggles was perhaps best symbolised by notorious events that took place at a house called Wild Goose Lodge, County Louth, in 1816. In 1816, a secret society carried out a raid on a house called Wild Goose Lodge, the home of Edward Lynch, where he lived with his extended family and three servants. Now Lynch himself was not being targeted over Conacre rent. The secret society were just looking for weapons. On this occasion, Lynch successfully drove them away. However, in what was a really foolish move, Lynch and his son-in-law testified and identified three of those who had been involved. The three were convicted, sentenced to death and hanged. This was not forgotten by the other members of the secret society. About six months later, on October the 30th, They returned to Wild Goose Lodge, but on this occasion they weren't looking for weapons. It was pure vengeance. They set fire to the house, killing all eight people inside, including a very young baby. Brutal as this was, the response of the authorities proved even more terrifying. After a prolonged investigation, the police eventually identified 18 people who were tried and convicted. Patrick Devan, identified as the leading figure in the attack, was hanged in the ruins of Wild Goose Lodge. Seventeen others, many of whom were innocent, were also hanged. After their death, their bodies were not buried, but instead were put on display in cages across County Louth as a warning to others. Their rotting corpses reflected the growing tensions at the heart of Irish society, propelled by increasing inequality. Such violence was by no means just a feature of life in Louth. For example, in Tipperary, between 1837 and 1847, ten landlords, nine employees of landlords and eight well-to-do farmers were assassinated, largely over land-related disputes. 
That is 27 assassinations in one county in just 10 years. To conclude this podcast, we need to travel to the west of Ireland and County Mayo, which would be devastated by the famine. In the decades before 1845, life here was very different to cities like Belfast or Dublin, but also to rural areas like Meath in the east of the island. Mayo is one of the most remote parts of Ireland. In the 19th century, the region was viewed by many from the rest of the island as being something of a wild land. In 1839, Caesar Otway, a man undoubtedly christened by parents with high expectations, ventured to Eris, the northwestern corner of County Mayo. His account of his travels there read like someone who had arrived in a strange, mysterious land, not a place 150 miles away from Otway's home. For example, this is just some of what Otway wrote. Stretching away southward along the mountainside, the old and only pass into Eris was pointed out to me. Indeed, without anyone to inform me, I could not have recognised this road. For who resorted to this land of no promise? Or who would venture on its unpleasant ways but the smuggler or the outlaw? Yes, I knew one who had come here, cruelly, against his grain. But he was a military man, and he was ordered. While Caesar Otway undoubtedly indulged in poetic licence fuelled by his prejudices, there was no denying life in Mayo and much of the far west was very different from the rest of Ireland in the early 19th century. Towns were smaller and less common, while farming was quite different. Mayo had once had a thriving cottage industry where weavers worked from their home supplementing farm incomes across the county. However, by the time Caesar Otway arrived in the late 1830s, it too had been hollowed out by the factories of Britain and Belfast who took the business away and with it the much needed money it had brought in. This left the people of Mayo, as one contemporary stated, looking to the land alone as a way of getting food. In a county where much of the land was poor and the population had soared, reaching 400,000 people by 1845, this created problems. The system of Conacre, prevalent in the east, was not employed much in the West. Instead, tenants rented farms that were pitilessly small tracts of land. As the population grew with each generation, a given family's land was subdivided between the male children. Therefore, each generation tended to be poorer than the previous one as they had less land to survive on. A male priest commented on how this led to a loss of land in the numerous fences. By 1841, over 70% of all holdings in Mayo were less than five acres. In these circumstances, potatoes came to dominate the diet of the poor. Nothing else could thrive in the poor land and produce the food needed. This left many with little land to grow cash crops that could be sold at market. To make life even more difficult, crop failures were far more common in the West. There was a failure of the potato crop in 1816, 1822, 1831 and 1835 along with numerous other partial failures which had dire consequences for the poor who lived largely on the potato. That said, while the majority lived on these small holdings, the county as a whole still did produce large amounts of surplus food on larger farms located on the better land. This food was not, however, for the people of Mayo. Even in times of terrible hardship and starvation, merchants sold this food onto the open market and the poor tenant farmers of Mayo rarely if ever could afford it so it was exported out of the county this highlighted a problem at the root of mayo and indeed irish society as the famine approached food production was not the issue inequality was dennis brown an mp for mayo articulated this best when he said in 1822 during food shortages there's plenty of food for everyone there is no deficiency of anything but the means of buying this was obvious in 1817, a time of extreme shortages in the aftermath of the Mount Tamboro eruption. While food was scarce, merchants in Ballina, one of the larger towns in Mayo, still prepared to export 30 to 40,000 pounds worth of food. This created tension, and the merchants of the town demanded soldiers to protect them in fear of what they called the working and lower classes. The soldiers arrived, but the poor still tried to stop the food being shipped out. They had little option. This resulted in two people being shot on the streets of Ballina by the soldiers. Even in years of far less serious shortages, tensions were never far from the surface. In 1840 there were shortages, but nothing like those of 1817. 
In that year, the price of potatoes, the staple food for many, was said to be high and advancing. For the poor, this was alarming, and when merchants gathered food for export in ports along the west coast, the hungry rioted to try and stop it leaving. In June 1840, riots broke out up and down the west coast at Tralee, Limerick and Sligo. That same summer of 1840, a ship arrived in the small village of Moyne in Killala Bay, County Mayo, to export food. On hearing that the ship planned to export potatoes, people from the local countryside were outraged. As the vessel approached the coast, they took action. The Freeman's Journal now takes up the story. Some of the country people, having been informed of the captain's intention, sallied out on Saturday last, beat him and his crew very severely, cut up the rigging of his vessel and injured her materially. Such events were just part and parcel of the ebb and flow of life, particularly in the West, where people lived in an increasingly unequal and volatile world. Food was being produced, but the poor couldn't afford it. They were reliant on one crop, the potato, the only food that could produce a nutritious diet on their small plots of land. While the dynamics in the east of the island were very different, a similar trend of growing inequality emerged. Through the course of the early 19th century, the poor were getting poorer. This was also the case in cities, where deindustrialization brought with it impoverishment. The exception to this was the story of Belfast, where the economy had been growing and work, albeit low paid, was available in factories in the city. Through these years, one of the key components of any famine, identified by the Indian expert on famine, Amartya Sen, as the inability of large groups of people to establish command over food in the society in which they live, was clearly taking hold in Ireland. This was not the whole story, however. In next week's show, we will look at potatoes, the soaring population, and something that was known as the poor law. Three very important factors. Don't forget... You can get lots of extra content by becoming a patron today at Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, Sloan.